Okay, let's review, uh, give you some pointers about how to complete worksheet number three. So work sh the first problem here is a problem illustrating the effect of natural selection on a, a two allele gene. Now, if you remember, we talked about how you can add a coefficient of selection and modify the Hardy-Weinberg equation, uh, but that gets complicated, and so we're not going to do that here, but we will kind of model it a little bit and see how a strong natural selection force could impact the fixation of a particular allele. In this case, we're going to look at the fixation of a dominant allele. But remember, when I say fixation of a dominant allele, if we're doing that, then at the same time, we have to completely eliminate the recessive allele. So think about that. How difficult is it for natural selection to get rid of recessive alleles, even if they're detrimental? Okay, so we're going to start out with your uh, familiar old Hardy-Weinberg. We're going to start with a p-value of 0.5, which means our q-value is also 0.5. That makes it nice and easy. If we're assuming it's a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then we can just use our p-squared plus 2pq plus q-squared, right? So we can do p-squared. I'll put that um, as a exponent here in a little bit, right? Our calculation for the heterozygotes is going to be 2pq. And then our calculation here for the homozygous re recessive will be q-squared. Okay, oops, sorry, Q squared. So, make those, it's gonna bother me if I don't make those exponents. So let's do that. Uh, where are we, font, superscript, okay. I can just hit you do here. Okay, so pretty easy, right? So 0.5 squared is equal to 0.25, we'll put zero in there, okay? 2pq, if you do that math, you're going to get 0 0.5, 0 0.25, right? Easy so far, stuff you did last unit should be simple, straightforward, okay? Now, assume some environmental change makes the recessive phenotype completely unfit, okay? Fitness level of zero. Now we're going to calculate our allele frequencies again. So if we're using these numbers, we can use any population, but let's just assume a nice round population of 1,000. So we should have 250 homozygous dominant, 500 homozygous recessive, and 250, sorry, 500 heterozygotes and 250 homozygous recessive, okay? But remember, fitness level of zero means that these individuals are either gonna die out or they won't be able to reproduce. Something is gonna prevent uh, anyone with a recessive phenotype, which is only the homozygous, recessives that's going to prevent them from contributing to the next generation. So we're going to calculate this like we did in the last unit, but we're not going to include any contribution from the homozygous recessives. So to count up all the p alleles, we would do um, 250 times 2, right? Because those 250 individuals carry two copies of that big allele. So let's do it like this. And then we're going to add in the 500 individuals, uh, or the 500 p alleles that would be contributed by the heterozygotes. But since they can do either a p or a q, we're only going to count them once, where these guys can do, they have two p alleles, so we count them twice. Now, when we do the q alleles, there's still some contribution. We would do 0 times 250. Right, just to show you that those individuals have a fitness level of zero. And then I'm going to add in the 500 Q alleles that can still be contributed by the heterozygotes. So remember, heterozygotes themselves don't show any detriment. They don't have the recessive phenotype. So their fitness level is the same as the homozygous dominant. So when we add all these up, this is what we end up with. We're going to have 1,000 P alleles, the big allele. And we're going to have only 500 of the little ones. Now, if we want to calculate our p and our q value, we need to divide by the total. Since we killed off all these recessive ones, we have only 1,500 alleles represented in this. So we're going to do 1,000 divided by 1,500. And that, of course, is going to equal 2 thirds or uh, 0.33. And again, if we want to be very uh, precise, we could put a line over that 3 or 0.33333, but for our purposes, we don't need to be that precise. Oops, so let's do this. 
And so of course here we do the same thing, 500 divided by 1500. And we get up, sorry. That's why we, I checked myself, right? I made a mistake in the math here. That's 2 thirds is 0 0.66, right? Not 0.33. And then this one would be 0.33. And there's a little bit of rounding error, of course, here, but that's fine. It doesn't matter, worry us. And it's not, we don't need to be that precise, okay? So now what we do is do our same thing, p squared, 2pq, and q squared, right? So we've got a p value, we've got a q value. Rather than write it all out like I did here, I'll just simply uh, calculate it, right? So 0 0.66 uh, squared. I'm actually going to grab my calculator here and do that. Actually, we'll just open up Excel. How's that? Just so you can see it. Okay, so 0.66 times 0.66, and again, a little bit of rounding error, but that's fine. So we're going to get about 0.3, or sorry, 0.44. Okay, now when we do 2pq, ah, all sorts of trouble with my numbers and operators here, but okay. And then we do um, 0.25, I'm sorry, 0.66 times 0.3 time, three, three times 2. And we end up actually with the same value here. You can double check that. And so then we've got left over. Now, you could do the, the math again. There's a little bit of rounding error, but we'll just say 0.12. Right. So if we add all these up now, we should be at 1. Okay. And I rounded this one uh, up just a little bit from where it would be, and we'd have a lot more decimals if it wasn't. But those little errors are not going to really be much of an issue one way or the other. Okay. So what was the reduction of frequency of the recessive allele from generation 1 to generation 2? Well, the frequency of the recessive allele in generation 1 was 0.25, and it went down to 0.33. I'll put my zeros here again just to be consistent. Okay. So the reduction is simply point, I'm sorry, <laughs> let's, let's make sure I'm comparing the right uh, things here. So my Q value, that's what I wanted, the frequency of my recessive allele, not the frequency of the genotype. So it went from 0.5, it went down to 0.33. So we'll simply say 0 0.5 minus 0 0.33, and we get a value of a of approximately 0.17. So we lost 17% of the big alleles that we had, or sorry, the little alleles that we had originally, okay? Now, I want you to repeat this. So just go through this and do it again. You're gonna start here. You're only gonna have to do this last generation, right? Calculate your p-value, and again, you can assume a nice round population size of 1,000. So you'd say 440, big A, big A, two times 440, plus uh, these guys count these guys once, add those, count your uh, little a's, the only contribution for little a's, remember we're not going to count these because their fitness level is zero, so the only contribution of little a's comes from the heterozygote. So add those all up, divide by the total, okay? Then that becomes your p-value here, your q-value there, plug it back into your equation and figure out your new genotype frequencies. Where, where then whatever your q-value is, you're going to take 0.33, subtract this new q-value and that gives you a reduction here, okay? now. What you will find is that there is a difference in the change of allele frequencies between generations. So going, what I mean is from generations, so let's put that in parentheses. From one to two, generation one to generation number two, let's put, do this. Generation one to generation number two, um, the reduction was 0 0.17. Uh, and then compare generation two what happened when we went from generation two to generation three. And what you'll find is we lost some of those recessive alleles, but we lost a lot fewer, okay, despite that same level of selection. So we talked about this in class, and even though we didn't see it mathematically, you should know what's going on here, okay? So this is simply as the recessive allele becomes less common, the 
force of natural selection, or maybe if we, we put it this way, it's exposed less to natural selection. That's a very succinct way to put it, but I want to explain it just so you, that you can understand this. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, think about it this way. The cost of carrying a recessive allele, even if it's lethal like it is in this case, is only a cost to your offspring. Because if you're a carrier, you don't bear the cost of that recessive allele because you have the dominant one to outweigh it. But there may be a cost to your uh, offspring. The only cost to your offspring, however, is if your mate is also a carrier. So as the allele becomes more and more rare, the chance of your mate carrying the same recessive allele is, is becomes more and more rare more and more rare. And so it only is costly to carry a recessive allele if your mate also carries it. So we have reduced, as we eliminate more and more and more of this recessive allele, there's less of a cost of carrying it. So what that means is recessive alleles can hang out for a really long time, albeit at low frequencies, but they can hang out for a really, really long time at, um, if they are recessive. If they're, even if they're 100% detrimental, they hang out for a really, really long time. So this, of course, is a directional selection. And the end result is fixation of the beneficial allele. Okay. Now, it might take a really, really long time, so it might take many, many generations to get rid of recessive alleles that are detrimental. But let's just very quickly, you're not asked to do this in the question, but just so that you can um, see the difference, let's go back and what if it was reversed? What if it was the dominant allele that was completely recessive? I'm sorry, the dominant allele, that doesn't make sense, right? The dominant allele that was completely, uh, had zero fitness level. So then what we would do is we'd say zero here. Now, these guys would also be zero, right? Because they would all die off, they would all die off. So the only alleles we would have, this would end up being zero. The only alleles we would have would be the ones that were in the recessive, uh, homozygous and of course when they mate with each other they can only make recessive and so what we'd end up with is 0 divided by 500 and 500 divided by 500 and we would end up with a p-value of 0 a q-value of 1 and then when we plug these in of course we're going to end up with Oops, something that looks like this. So with the same level of selection, we completely eliminated a dominant allele that's bad. It just took one generation. Now, this is a little bit extreme. Most fitness effects are not lethal like this one, but, but this would be. So it kind of shows you the difference. With the same level of selection, it's going to take dozens and dozens, maybe even thousands of generations to eliminate a recessive allele that's bad. But a dominant allele that's bad at the same level of selection gets eliminated immediately with just one generation. Okay, So keep that in mind. All right, so let's look at number two. Now number two is a little bit tricky, but we'll walk you through it. You have lots of guidance here. Okay, So to do this, we need to do some setup here. We're going to breed populations. And these are called true breeding populations. Mendel did this with his peas, but we're going to do it for three different character uh, characters in these uh, fictional insects here. So eye color, antenna, and then the size of the wings. Okay, So little e, little e is red eyes. You can see that by looking at this population. If we have dominant alleles here, we end up with long skinny antenna. If we have the recessive alleles, we have these kind of club-like or lobed antenna at the end. And the recessive wing phenotype is short wings. Okay, So just look at that. Now, this heterozygote has been bred a special way, and this is critical. So it says all of the recessive alleles are found on the same chromosome in population number one. So without crossing over, only two types of gametes can be formed. So this guy, even though it could make more gametes if these were uh, randomly mixed through the population, we bred a special population so we can only make all dominant or all recessive. And that's critical for this study, and this was done in, in fruit flies to help map the first genes in fruit flies. Okay, so we'll just fill this out. The phenotype of each recessive allele. For eyes, it's red eyes. All right, you can see that in these two individuals that carry two copies of the recessive allele. For antenna, we'll just say clubbed antenna. Okay, 
And then for wings, find one with recessive. Here's the other one with recessive. They have the short wings. If you want to say short wings, that's fine. Um, the technical term for this, if you look it up, is brachyptery or brachypterous wings. But you don't need to know that. Short wings is fine. Okay. So we know without crossing over, population one can only make these gametes. We set that up. What type of gametes can be made by the other populations? And this is easy because for each gene, they only have one type of allele. So population number two, let's zoom out just a bit. Population number two can make little e, big A, little w. That's the only gamete they can make. Population three can make little e, little a, big w. And then population four can make uh, big e, little a, little w. That's it. So now I'm asking you to do a Punnett square between, if we crossed population one and population two. And so we're going to put up here the types of gametes they can make. Now population one can make either all dominant or all recessive. And population two can only make this one type, little e, big A, little w. So when we cross those together, we're going to end up with this. And all I'm doing, this is just what we do with Punnett squares, right? Take that allele and that allele and put them both here in the offspring. So these guys can only make two types of offspring. They can make big E, little e, big A, big A, big W, little w. That's one or 50% of their offspring. One half of their offspring would look like that. Or they could be little e, little e, big A, little a, little w, little w. So 50-50. This is a, just a, a, simple di a simple cross Mendelian um, probabilities here. Okay, and so I'm going to do the same thing here for these other ones. We'll fill them out. You can fill them out and follow me if you'd like. Now this one, population three, is little e, little a, big W. Okay, in fact, I'll fill out these and then let you guys just simply fill in the, uh, what their offspring would be like. Okay, so population one, same thing. Population one can only make these two types of gametes. Population one, or four, only makes that type of gamete and then just fill out these things, okay? So we cross these, and this is what we expect. These Punnett squares tell us our expectation. We're expecting there should only be two types of offspring. Now notice these guys, oh, I'm sorry, it's asked us to predict the phenotypes. We've only done genotypes so far, so let's predict the genotypes. So the cross between population one and two, now notice all of the antenna are gonna be skinny. We don't, we only have carriers for the recessive antenna gene. We don't have any individuals that have uh, little a, little a. So all of these guys, they're gonna have skinny antenna, but we'll ignore that since they're all the same. They're gonna have, half of them are gonna have red eyes and long wings, all right? So that's that half of the population. So we'll predict 50% should be red eyed with long wings. And then the other 50% are gonna be white eyes. Oh, I got those mixed up. I had to double check myself, right? Because the dominant um, phenotype is white eyes. So big E, little e, this is white eyes, long wings. And these half are gonna have red eyes and short wings. That's important that we don't mix those up. Okay, so fill out the genotypes here, fill out the genotypes here. We've already put the different gametes that can be made, so just combine them together and then figure out what those should be. And I'll let you do that, but it should be 50% of one type and put it back here a little bit so it fits nicely and 50% of the other type. So fill those out, same thing for this third cross. So we're predicting 50-50, but yet when we actually do this cross, we don't get the 50-50 we predicted. So we predicted 50% wide eyes and long wings. We were close, but not quite. We predicted 50% red eyed short wings, not quite. We have 7% total, let's just put that over here. 7% total that are breaking the rules. Now, the only way that they could have these combinations is if we broke up this association we were talking about. Now remember, the big E, big A, big W are all on one chromosome. Little E, little A, little W are all on another chromosome. So the only way we could get white eyes and short wings together is if there is a crossing over event. So 7% break the rules due to crossing over. 
So during meiosis, there was a crossing over event. It broke up the association of all the big A, all the dominant alleles on one chromosome, all the recessive alleles on the other chromosome. Okay, same thing here. 5% breaking the rules due to crossing over. 12% breaking the rules to crossing over. And the key to understanding this is the frequency of crossing over. I'm going to write it. You don't need to write this on the worksheet, but just so you can understand it. The frequency of crossing over is proportional to the distance between the genes. And so what that means is we had 7% recombinants here because those two genes are far enough apart to have crossing over randomly occurring 7% of the time. These are far enough apart to only have crossing over occur 5% of the time. So what that means, here we're looking at the I gene and the wing gene. The I gene and the wing gene are farther apart, 7% relatively, than the I gene and the antenna gene. They're only 5% apart. And the wing gene and the antenna gene, in total, to add these together, are 12% apart. And so we can use these as estimates of distance. So finally, what we're going to do is we are going to map the location of these genes on the chromosome. Now the key to this is, is it is a relative position. We can tell relative to one another how close they are to one another, but we don't know if they're on this end of the chromosome or this end or what order they are. And that doesn't matter, but we do want to put them on there in their relative position. So I'm going to use just insert um, a box here. We'll just insert a little shape here to represent gene. Okay, so here we go. We can make this whatever gene we want. Let's make it the first one here, the I gene. Okay. So I'm going to put a little bit of an E above that box. There we go. Now let's hit enter. Push that down just a little bit. Okay, so there's my I gene representing that bar. And then I'm going to put the next one on here, the wing gene. We'll make it a different color. How's that? You can just copy, paste, and change the color. I'm going to put the wing gene here, and I'm going to put it far enough apart. You don't have to be proportional. I'll put a little note here above, but that's my wing gene. And we know from this first crossing over experiment, the I gene and the wing gene are far enough apart to have a crossing over rate of 7%. So let's put that in between. So we'll say 7%. Uh, percent. And word's not ideal for this, but you can fiddle around with it and it'll work okay. So I gene and wing gene are 7% apart. The next data I have here are the I gene and the antenna gene, and they are 5% apart. Okay, oh, I was going to change to make this a nice different color. Mm, there we go, shape format, uh, shape fill. Let's make it a nice pretty green color. Okay, just so we can tell them apart. Now I need to put uh, the antenna gene. The I gene and the antenna gene are far enough apart that we have 5% recombinants. Now, I don't know whether I should put it on this side or on this side until I look at this other crossing over experiment. They were 12% apart. So that tells me that that wing gene has to be far enough away from the antenna gene that crossing over occurs 12% of the time. So I actually would put it on this side a little bit farther. And again, I don't care that you're exactly right, but we'll just put it a little bit farther than that one. And let's change it to a nice pretty uh, how about purple? Ooh, let's make it that color purple. Okay, And so here I have my antenna gene. And it's far enough apart from the I gene to do, um, oh, I'm sorry, it actually should go a little bit closer, right? Because it's only going to represent 5%. That looks good. So here we're going to have 5%. There's the I gene with 7% between them. And now notice that all my numbers work out. Between the antenna gene and the wing gene, I have a total of 12% crossing over. And so by doing these crossing over experiments, I now know in relative positions, and again, I could shift these all down to this part of the chromosome, or I could flip them around. That's not important for this, but relative to one another, we know where they are located. So this was how the very first gene mapping was done. They bred these uh, unusual strains that had all of the dominant alleles on one gene, all the recessive alleles on another one. They did crosses with other strains, and then they counted offspring. And you have to do this with lots and lots of offspring so that your numbers are pretty close to what they would be, and uh, that you don't have a small sample size that throws those off. Okay, So that takes care of the problem number two. 
Now, problem number three, I'll let you do part A, B, C, and D. All you need to do is, is go to this um, chart here. You can hold down the control button. It'll bring it up like this. And just run. I think it's asking you to run 10 simulations. Okay. So it says, take our little simulator here. Uh, start at 0.5, a population of 200. Set the generations to 200. I think those are actually all the default settings. All right. So 0 0.5, 200, 200. Yep, that's it. Do the default and then just run it. 10 times. So one, two, and it's going to ask you to record how many times we fixed the big allele. Here we didn't fix either of them, right? But we fixed the big allele once, twice, three times, there's four times, I think this is my 10th one. So just count how many times. So we did it five and, or sorry, six, and four of them didn't become fixed. Now, very likely you're going to have a different answer, and that's part of understanding this question. But just do that, put your answers here. Okay? Now, the last part I do want to go over, because this is the trickiest part. The graph at right represents a neutral allele. Now that's key. If it's neutral, what is the force of um, natural selection on it? And hopefully your answer is, well, nothing. That's the definition of neutral. It's not going to push it up. It's not going to push it down. So we only have one replicate here. And so the direction this goes, whether it goes up or down, is not important because there is no natural selection. Okay? But what is important is the severity of this fluctuation. Right? So during this process, did the number of individuals in the population change? So notice how much it's fluctuating over the first hundred or so generations. It's bouncing up and down like crazy. What does that mean? How big is a population if we have a neutral allele that is changing in frequency drastically from generation to generation? And then notice what happens after population 100. This severity of the fluctuation goes down dramatically. It's still fluctuating, but only a little bit up and down, up and down, up and down. Again, whether it's going up or down is not important. So did the population change? By the way, it did, right? Somewhere a little after 100 generation, it changed. So what was the population like here at the beginning? What was the population size here at the end? And what was that change? So write what that change was and how you know is easy, right? How we know is by looking at the amount of fluctuation. And so, but what was it? So review it. Again, if you have questions, specific questions, email them to me. That should give you, though, basically we did worksheet number three for you, right? So follow along. Again, any other questions, that's fine. I understand there still might be some confusion. Send me an email, and uh, I'll answer those.